live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? You're tuned in once again to another episode of the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter, Scott McKay on YouTube, Real Scott McKay on Instagram, Mountaintop Summit on Facebook, and of course, MountaintopPodcast.com. With me today is a new friend of mine. He hails from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, and he is a writer, a speaker, a coach, and a hero advocate at Live the Hero. His name is Anthony Simeone. Anthony, how you doing, man? Great, Scott. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, the pleasure is all mine because you specialize in an area that I just love to talk about, and that's being a hero for, you know, I guess as a man in general, but specifically for the women in our lives. And we've talked about heroism on this show before. We've talked to people who are heroes in real life in many ways. But the angle that we decided upon for this particular show, I find particularly exciting. And that is, of course, how to be a hero for the woman in your life, even in subtle ways. Because you know what, Anthony? Not all of us are Navy SEALs. Not all of us are fighter pilots and MMA fighters or lion tamers in the circus. So Give us your take, first of all, on what heroism actually is and what it means today, because I know you have some very interesting takes on that. Yeah. So we really need to broaden what it means to be a hero. You know, we think of it from popular culture and from even from ancient mythology. You know, it's this larger than life character. But in reality, ancient myth wasn't supposed to make us feel inadequate about ourselves. It was to give us an ideal to strive for, to give us something larger than life to educate people on what it meant to be a hero. And I think today we've kind of done ourselves a disservice as far as our modern mythology making. So all the heroes in our pop culture are, you know, those figures you talk about, like the Navy SEAL or the fireman. And and those people are heroic in a very broad way, in a very big way, you know, in the big crisis moments of life. But what heroism in the ancient tradition wanted to teach us was you could be a hero every day in a small way or just in your life every day. So heroism is in some ways a banal thing, really. It should be more common. And every day in your life, there's even the smallest opportunities to do small little things for other people to uplift them. Because really, that's what a hero is, is someone who steps out of the routine, the status quo of everyday life, and extends a helping hand to their fellow human being and uplifts the world around them. And therefore, you help yourself because other help is self-help. Because if you make a better world around you, heroically, you uplift your own life and you create better situations for your own life, not just for other people. So it really starts with, you know, expanding the definition of being a hero. And heroism, I like to say, is a mindset. It's not a moment. We think of heroism as just being a moment in time where you get to run into a burning building and that's just once in your life, and that's heroic. But really, it's, it's, there's opportunities every day to be heroic. Well, do those opportunities represent themselves in distinct, discrete moments, though? It really comes with, again, being in the mindset. So it's not like you're sitting there raring to go. You know, you have to kind of train yourself. And really, it can be cultivated. That mindset of being heroic can be cultivated just by studying Joseph Campbell and really kind of chunking his journey down, you know, your other guests probably talked about the hero's journey in detail, but you can chunk Joseph Campbell's monomyth, the hero's journey into three major sections, the call to adventure, the road of trials or the adventure itself, and then the return with wisdom, the lessons learned. So you have to kind of be mindful. They do present themselves. So it could be everything from, you know, the proverbial helping the old lady across the street to If you want to talk about being in a relationship, you know, when your wife presents a certain situation or issue or wants your attention, you you focus in and you use your active listening and getting into that. Sometimes breaking out of the status quo of your own life, the daily grind of going to work and coming home and being with your family and just solving all the problems in your life on a daily basis, that can distract you. But if you focus and say, I'm going to be mindful, I'm going to be heroic here and just be just listen heroically and then say, I'm going to step in, I'm going to be present, I'm going to listen to my wife right now. She's got this issue she wants to talk about. I'm not just going to tune out. So even those moments in life, you can see that as the call to adventure. You know, here's there's something stepping up here. There's a situation here. How am I going to choose to address this? Am I going to tune out and just go along the, the rut of my status quo of my life? Or am I going to step out and really pay attention to this present moment? 
So the mindset is such that, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a man who's ready to lend a helping hand and be of value to others such that when the moments actually do come up, it's almost automatic that you step up. You don't even have to think about it. Am I on the right track? Yeah, exactly. And I think we have a lot of cynicism that we're getting fed through the mass media and through, you know, we have something that we evolved called the negativity bias, you know, the survival mechanism that gets keyed up and fired all the time. You know, we were talking about the saber tooth tiger before we got on the the call today and the recording. And the saber tooth tiger is in our homes right now because through our TV, you know, there's not the saber tooth tiger outside the cave anymore, but we still have that same ancient brain in the modern world. So the negative news cycle stimulates that all the time. So we're constantly amped up and kind of living from moment to moment, not really keeping our heads down and just thinking about, you know, survival. But the hero's journey makes us human again. It makes us be mindful of, okay, I have to step back, not just run the rat race and take a moment to consider my life and observe and kind of detach for a moment and be a little stoic, not in the stuff your emotions down way, but in the, okay, I'm going to take control of this moment. I'm going to focus on what I can and cannot control and really be present. So it's that balance between that survival mechanism that kind of shuts our minds down. And then the, what the ancients wanted to teach us in mythology to like wake us up and to be just to be present is to be heroic sometimes, you know, rather than just wrapped up in our own daily grind. You know, when you're wrapped up in your own daily grind and you're inside your head so much, you start being more selfish. You start thinking about yourself and, you know, looking out for number one and self-preservation, whereas heroism is by definition very generous and selfless. You're looking in a compassionate way at how you can help other people, maybe not forcing it on them or anything, but looking for those opportunities where it's going to be welcomed instead of being oblivious to it because you're so buried in your own stuff. And, you know, that's something that I think is worth bringing up is this idea of compassion actually being a very masculine trait, because in order for there to be a hero, there has to be a recognition that someone else is in distress and empathizing with their position and wanting to help that pain stop. Now, that can be as simple as the pain of a woman not being able to reach a box of cereal at the top shelf of a grocery store, you know. So, I mean, obviously there's minutia in daily life, which very much supports your idea of heroism being an everyday, almost mundane mindset in, in preparation possibly for the day where you have to, you know, pull someone out of a car wreck. But I love that about what you said. Another thing that you said that I want you to elaborate more on is this idea of modern myth-making. Now, I think we can all read the Iliad or Homer's Odyssey and, you know, realize that that's the kind of myth that aforementioned Joseph Campbell would talk about in sight. But, of course, Hollywood has latched on to that hero's journey mindset big time because it's very marketable and it, frankly, makes for wonderful movies. I mean, you've got Star Wars, which is a classic hero's journey. You've got a guy who's plucked out of nowhere and expected to do something great, and he just doesn't feel ready or prepared for it. And, of course, he rises up to the occasion. He conquers this horrible enemy that's out to destroy the world, gets all the glory at the end, gets the girl. Hero's journey comes full circle. Modern myth-making, though, has evolved even from that, in my opinion, to, first of all, you talked about the negative news cycle. The people we're setting up as heroes are people who believe like we do politically, and then we villainize people on the other side simply because, in large part, I mean, people will argue with me about this and say, no, no, they really are villains, because they neither understand them nor agree with them, nor do they care to. But, you know, seems to me very reactive and a somewhat arbitrary way to assign heroism or villainhood to people. And on top of that, you've got Hollywood really specializing nowadays in creating anti-hero figures. You know, it's Quentin Tarantino's favorite thing to do and always has been. Have bad guys in movies and somehow trick your brain into rooting for them. And since then, and certainly there have been examples before, but Nowadays, more than ever, it seems like almost every male lead in a movie or even on TV shows is more of an anti-hero than a hero, almost as if, hey, this guy is very good at getting away with rather non-heroic things, and I'm still rooting for him anyway. I mean, you got your Breaking Bads of the World and Mad Men of the World and, and countless movies we could cite. 
What's your take on all of that? I mean, this modern myth making. I want to hear much more about that. Yeah. So uh, modern myth making in terms of Hollywood. You know, yes. I mean, the reason why we keep creating heroic stories is just because there's something intrinsic in us that wants to be. I think there really is. Uh, we are really evolved to be compassionate creatures because we only became the dominant animals on the planet and the beings on the planet and rose to consciousness because we cooperated. We're not good animals. We don't have claws. We don't have night vision. We don't have sharp teeth. We had to cooperate to become the dominant species on the planet. So there's something in us that harkens back to this cooperative past that rose us up from just, you know, every other species and rose us up to prominence in the world. So Heroism, I think, taps back into that instinct for cooperation. And but there's also a part of us that wants to be exceptional and wants to benefit the uh, our other human beings in our life and in the world around us. And frankly, I think that's what makes us most of us feel remorseful when we don't do that. You know, we we might feel more remorseful or bad if we don't act to help others and assist others in this world. So the hero's journey is so powerful that it echoes throughout history and you think it would get old and people would stop using that storytelling method, but we still do. It comes back and like, we can't help ourselves. I mean, as far as anti-heroes are concerned, you know, that's an interesting point because I think the opposite of a hero really is a bystander, uh, is someone who doesn't, is not really a villain. The opposite isn't a villain. It's a bystander. If you don't step up when you see people in need, that's really the opposite of a hero. But a villain, I think, is a hero that fails to the, the villain takes action and fails to help others. They take action in self-aggrandizement. That's a villain. They could have been a hero, but they take action to support only themselves and to think only of themselves and to use their abilities and their powers just for themselves. So that's a villain, a bystander, and a hero. Now, the anti-hero is another thing. And then there's this work of Carl Jung that we can tap into there who you know, talked about integrating the shadow self. And I think that the shadow has become stronger in the modern age because of a lot of the cynicism that we've developed, a lot of ideologies that push us towards individualism. You know, you can be in a, a unique individual and have individuality. That's good. We need everybody to be unique and an individual, but individualism has become sort of like a pseudo-religion, sort of like this cult of the self. And I think the shadow side kind of comes from that, but the shadow can be redeemed. You know, we can integrate that shadow, embrace the dark part of ourselves instead of shutting it away and stuffing it down, because that's where mental pathology comes from. If you're trying to deny your emotions or deny how you're feeling or kind of buy into like these individualistic mentalities, that's when you sort of make that shadow stronger. And if in mythology, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. So the shadowy part of yourself is that cave. And if you don't explore yourself and get into self-exploration, which a lot of guys are not encouraged to do, unfortunately, you know, there we're taught to kind of ignore that and to stuff things down and be a man and be tough and don't look weak. But really, if you're not self-exploring and delving into your shadow part of yourself, I think that's why people relate to the anti-hero because they feel like they are that dark character. They feel like the oppression of the world or things and circumstances in life are against them in the modern age. So they want to be the anti-hero who steps out and does the dark things that sometimes occur to them. Because if you don't go into that self, into that cave that is yourself, you won't find that treasure of self-actualization, self-efficacy, uh, self-esteem. You know, We talk about self-esteem and sometimes that's a dirty word. But self-esteem doesn't come from just being that you're a special snowflake and you're special because everybody is. It comes from self-efficacy, looking for the skills and the talents and the things that make you who you are and cultivating them. Self-efficacy gives rise to real self-esteem. And I think if more men went into themselves and explored that darkness within them and embraced it, rather than trying to slay the monster, you embrace the beast within you and say, you know what, I'm not going to hold this against myself. I'm going to have some self-care. I have dark thoughts, but you know what? And I have dark feelings, dark emotions. I have things that well up inside of me. But if I embrace it and say, you know what, it's a part of me, I'm not going to act on them. I'm going to just embrace them as part of just the human condition and then move forward with my life. This is going to be the kind of conversation that the guys listening can really dig into. And I want to help with that. Sure. <laughs> First of all, I am absolutely amazed by what you just said about heroism kind of in a box. The mass media has told us what heroism should look like. Here's how you do it. Here's the paint by numbers approach to being a hero. 
and guys everywhere are saying, you know, I'm just not feeling that. And yet we see anti-heroes or even villains and we relate to them because it's just more fun. I mean, it's more entertaining. I mean, you watch a movie like Whiplash where J.K. Simmons plays this absolute monster of a teacher who slaps his students and yells at them, but he drops intelligent quips with such precision and he's hilarious, even as he's just being mean. And at the end, you see the kid, despite how this horrible, mean guy has been treating him, rise up and become, you know, in the opinion of most critics who've watched the movie, more of a man and a better drummer. Yeah. And it was all because he just got the hell beat out of him by this guy who's been generally described in cinematic circles as a villain. Yeah. And... We look at that movie and we love that character, the one played by J.K. Simmons, who most of you guys may know as the guy from the Farmers commercials, the Farmers Insurance commercials. Right. We hand him an Oscar for it because we freaking love it. And every time Dennis Hopper was ever in a movie, you know, he was a bad guy, except for Easy Rider, probably. And he was beloved because we can't go do that kind of stuff without being punished without being arrested. But you know what? It's kind of in our psyche. We got these dark parts of ourselves and we got these lighter parts of ourselves. And you see kids, I mean, hell, you got the Avengers movie that just came out at the time we're publishing this and it broke every record because you have these superheroes who aren't your grandfather's superheroes. They're not, you know, Superman in blue and red tights being a Mr. Nice guy, but he's just really strong and can stop a train. you got these guys who sometimes they got to get down and gritty and dirty and be sort of mean to beat the enemy. And men love that. I mean, we just think, yeah, hell yeah, man. we got to kick these guys' asses, and we can't be Mr. Nice guy to do it. Um, if you've ever seen the Narcos series on Netflix, one of the most striking moments from the first season of that show, when they're going after Pablo Escobar, is when the narrator, who's an American DEA agent, said, for the longest time, and I'm paraphrasing this, for the longest time, we were trying to catch Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel by conventional methods and staying above the law and being the good guys. That meant we had a certain code of ethics we had to follow. But we realize that our enemy, you know, the Medellin cartel and Pablo Escobar specifically, weren't following any rules. They were breaking all the rules. So in order to get the bad guy, we had to become bad guys to stand a fighting chance at it. So ultimately, heroism of some sort brought down Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel. But it wasn't a very nice, pretty, sanitary way to do it. Another example of what I think you're talking about, and help me out here, is let's say you're a Baltimore Ravens fan or a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Tom Brady is a villain. He's the freaking enemy. At best, he's an anti-hero. I mean, you can watch what he does in the Super Bowl, and you just know he's going to bring the team back from 14 points down because he's Tom freaking Brady, and he's going to do it again. You can't stand the guy, but you got to give him credit, right? But Basically, you have a picture of him in your office with a circle with a line through it. You'd wish he would retire and go away so your team would have a chance again. <laughs> but, and you know what I'm going to say, don't you? If you live in Boston, Massachusetts, he's an unqualified hero. The guy could do no wrong. So a lot of this right. anti-hero villainhood, heroism really exists in the mind of the beholder, doesn't it? I mean, let me give you an extreme example. If a guy breaks into my house and I have to shoot him dead to protect my family, I'm a hero to my family. But to his family, if he was like a 16-year-old kid doing something stupid, I'm going to be the worst guy who ever lived and they're going to take me to court on all kinds of civil charges and possibly even press, you know, it wouldn't work in Texas very well because of the castle law, but even in certain states or locales, maybe even press charges against me. It's all perspective. And that's so strange how there's this you know, sliding scale, this relativism, as it were, as to whether you're a hero or a villain and whether this has anything to do with good or evil, even at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, there's a lot to unpack here, but for the J.K. Simmons character, you know, in that movie, he was actually, I would say he's actually the one of the mentors, one of the wise men that you meet along the way of the hero's journey. 
So the kid was <laughs> the, the Obi Wan Kenobi, only not nearly as nice. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. he was the nasty Obi Wan Kenobi. He yeah. was he was the challenge. He was part of the adventure. You know, he's there. The, you grow from adversity. You know, we use the word adventure. And sometimes you use the word adventure and you think it only is uh, great things where you get the girl and you do all kinds of cool stuff and you have a laser sword and you do flips and acrobatic jumps. Sometimes the adventure is you meet your dad and he cuts your hand off and he's the worst guy in the universe. You know, the adventure has ups and downs. So there's foils for, you know, there's things that need to be catalysts. There's characters in the hero's story that need to spur them to growth and to be part of the trials of, on that road of trials that for the hero to come back changed. And sometimes the heroes change, you know, they're better in some ways and they bring wisdom back to the rest of the world, but they may be irrevocably broken. You know, if you look at Frodo and Lord of the Rings, you know, he comes back, he's stabbed by one of the, well, one of the bad specters that, you know, inhabits the world. He's crippled permanently. The wound never heals. And, you know, he comes back and he changes his world for the better. He makes the lives of his people better. But in some ways, he's broken and he's never the same. That's the gray area that, you know, is necessary to remember in the hero's journey. And yes, in, at some point in history, we just sanitized everything to like black and white. You know, but even in Star Wars, you can see that Luke slowly sort of becomes over the original trilogy, sort of becomes more similar to his father, to Darth Vader, than you think he would become. So there is part of sacrificing part of the light in yourself. Yes, there's always going to be a gray area. There's always a matter of perspective. But I think it really comes down to is what greater good are you serving? Are you uplifting the world around you? In some way, even if it's just defending your family, yes, you're going to be a villain in someone else's eyes, even if it's the villain thinking you're the villain. You know, the villain, again, is very, like I said earlier, is closely related to the hero. They're heroes that sort of went bad. They are serving only themselves. So that's heroes and villains are, you know, foils to each other. And they're not that dissimilar. And they're very close to each other. Just it's what are the motivations are they, and how many people are they supporting? Is it just themselves or is it themselves and the world? And that can sometimes be the only difference between the hero and the villain. Well, even in a world characterized by moral relativism, as we see even here in the politics of the United States of America currently, it is really hard to even figure out where the moral high ground is to even sort out true villainhood versus true heroism. I mean, we're talking about, you know, one person's villain being another person's hero and how that might be a matter of perspective, but even the ethics, the mindset and the values of one particular person to another is relative. I mean, there was just a video on last night where someone was taking videos in front of an abortion clinic and calling the people there who were praying for people who went in there, the evil ones who were the non-Christian horrible people who needed to repent from a Christian perspective. So, you know, even within one faith, there are massive, massive differences of opinion with regard to what is inherently right and what is wrong. So I think it's amazing you would bring that up because it's going to make guys think. Another thing you brought up was this whole idea of adventure. And interestingly enough, we had another guy on this show talking about adventure, Derek Loudermilk, who runs Art of Adventure. Mm -hmm. And we defined adventure together as getting outside of your comfort zone. Absolutely. And I think it's very curious and perhaps not a coincidence that you talked about heroism itself with the same vernacular. I mean, it's getting out of your comfort zone, getting out of your little safe place and lending a hand to others, even when it's uncomfortable for you. And that is by its very essence by definition, adventure unto itself. So a hero is an adventurer. I would say not all heroism is adventure. Maybe not all adventure is heroism, but they definitely go hand in hand, right? Yeah, I think you cannot be unchanged if you go out into the world. You Sometimes we need to force ourselves. We live in such an age of comfort. And you know we've given ourselves this illusion that we don't need each other. We give ourselves the illusion just because of our incredible technological convenience that we are islands unto ourselves a lot of times. That's why I think a lot of guys slip into these mindsets where they get very cynical and they become very down on humanity. But let me tell you, when the lights go out, when the crisis happens, what do we do? We always go back to supporting each other. 
That's true. And if you look out into the world, you will see time and again, when crisis strikes, we come back together. It's part of who we are. And we can't remain unchanged if we go out into the world. So sometimes we have to push ourselves these days into seeing that helping others really is developing ourselves. It's inextricably linked. And that's one of the lessons that heroism beats into us. You know, we have to, it reminds us through the stories that come back over and over that we tell that it's you going and helping others is self-help and vice versa. Helping yourself, being a more disciplined, empathetic, compassionate, active resilient person can't help but influence some part of your world. And sometimes we need to pick our battles and we need to really focus on what we can change. Usually we can only control how we react to situations in life. Maybe we can't control the situations, but heroes look to solutions intrinsically from within. And how can I change my reaction to this? And one of my idols is Viktor Frankl. You know, he was uh, in his family. Search for meaning. Yeah, man search for meaning. Sometimes all you have left is your own hope for the future. And it's amazing what he went through. And he saw the other prisoners in the labor camps. With the, those that gave up hope for the future, they're the ones that withered away and died. And just for the guys who are listening who may not be familiar with Viktor Frankl, he wrote from the position of being a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp. Yeah. Where you've lost everything. Yeah. He lost everything. But what has sustained him is that, first of all, whatever you do in life, your accomplishments, they can't be taken away from you. And if you have pride in yourself and you go out and have been living a fulfilled life, you can lock those things away in your memory. They can never be taken away. So your accomplishments, you can be stripped of all of your human dignity, but they can never take away until they put you to death, unfortunately. But even up until the last, you have your pride in yourself and your accomplishments. But also, if you have hope for the future and if you put faith back in the highest common denominator, as I call it, in humanity, we've made it this far. We've survived this long despite atrocities over the ages. You know, there is something about us that survives and can also thrive beyond that survival. So, you know, all of those things go into heroism that make it a powerful tool that's timeless. And I'm not surprised that I echoed the same vernacular from this other person because you delve into heroism enough and into the heroism science and into the literature of Joseph Campbell and everything, everybody else who's contributing to this corpus of work. You, we all start saying the same things just by dint of studying it. So it's an amazing discipline. Isn't that something? You know, you brought up Viktor Frankl right as I had on my mind. The idea that it's been widely discussed in the news media and in op-ed pieces that perhaps America is so divided amongst ourselves because we're not facing any real crisis. Crisis. You know, in World War II, we were all together. Shortly after 9-11 happened, we all banded together. One of the quotes from right after 9-11 that's always stuck in my mind, and I can't for the life of me attribute it to anybody right now, was that the terrorists went after United and American, and they ended up with United Americans. And I always thought that was cool. You know, the airplanes that were hijacked were from United Airlines and American Airlines. And yet right now, it seems like people are looking for a way to be a hero. And when there's no outward enemy per se or something that's just a real baleful influence on this culture that must be defeated, we go mm -hmm. looking for it. And in the absence of that coming from an outside place, we start eating ourselves alive. And I think that's really unfortunate. And people could argue, okay, well, look, climate change – et cetera, et cetera, all these things deserve our attention. But they're not things that we should destroy each other over. We, we should be able to be united Americans about that. A mm -hmm. couple last things to wrap up here I want to get your quick opinion on. Kids see all these superhero movies, and do you think it in any way, shape, or form makes them feel like I can't stand up to that? I can't be heroic in small ways because what's been demonstrated to me is something no human can attain. Or does it, in fact, empower us to want to be heroes, even if we're seeing it portrayed in front of us on such a grand scale? I mean, can it go either way or is it one or the other? I think for children, we have that sense of wonder still. You know, we're not as cynical as when we become adults. So for children, I think that heroic stories are purposely larger than life. You know, they always have been. Look at the stories in ancient Greece and Rome of all the ancient – the gods and the demi-humans like Hercules, you know. We need to be entertained. Human beings have this need to be entertained. We get easily bored. We have this thing for novelty. So at the same time, you know, we can be educated. We need to be entertained and educated. That's that's how the ancients educated their children. There were no formal schools. It was you got taught through 
plays, through performance, through theater. And it, so it had to be larger in life to keep your attention. So then the residual, the how it made you feel would last after you stopped watching it. So then what lives on is the kid's impulse. So you see after a movie, they want to fly around. They want to you know, put a towel on and they fly around like it's a cape and they go out and they fight with their friends and heroes and villains, good guys and bads, cowboys and Indians. So that I think for children, that residual wonder and that you know, the basic structure, the impulse towards heroism and compassion and empathy stays naturally for them. I feel like for adults consuming it, yeah, we may get cynical, but I think if we allow ourselves in this day and age to really look for that innocence we had again and go back to what I keep calling the highest common denominator, no matter what your religious stance, you can be from atheist to evangelical Christian. If we all reprioritize community, reprioritize the shared humanity we all have, you know, it, I think that's the tool and the path that I try to use when I talk to people to get through the political rhetoric. And honestly, everyone in the political spectrum has used this demonizing factor to try to, you know, jockey for votes. And I think they have done a disservice. All sides of the political spectrum have Nobody's done a disservice. Nobody's blameless on either side. Exactly. No. Exactly. So it's the humanity we have to get back to. That's the shared common denominator that is universal. You know what's really hilarious is. If I show my son and daughter Nitro Circus videos right before a big race, they ride harder. <laughs> so I, right. I agree with you a thousand percent. Yeah. You know, if they're watching Travis Pastrana do crazy things in a, you know, semi truck, then they go out and they kick butt on a more massive level on their BMX bikes at the next race. No doubt. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Here's the million dollar question. We obviously can't be superheroes. We can't be larger than life every moment of our life. And in many ways, what you've been talking about is the celebration of the mundane as heroism. So with that in mind, we have a bunch of guys here who want to be heroes to women. What does that mean? And what are some of the examples that we can look toward doing on a daily basis? And I fully understand in that context, you said it's not about the moments, but we need to throw some candy at this parade and give guys kind of a visual example of what this looks like. You know, it's not about what some people that are more negative about the male-female relationship these days. There's lots of guys that are pickup artists and things, and they kind of just have reduced the male-female dynamic as being just an interplay and exchange, just, you know, a sexual exchange. And they really kind of debase the male-female interaction. And I think what heroism can teach us is that, first of all, it's back to humanity. There's a divine spark in us. No matter where you think it comes from, whether you think it comes from a god or just from chemicals or whatever you think it is, it's, first of all, the respect for a woman as a human being. And it doesn't have to mean that you're a white knight. A lot of people kind of just go either or. Either you're a chad, as they call them, or whatever, an alpha male, whatever you want to call it, or you're a white knight and you're just a simp. You know, that we need to cut through that. And Google back and you just respect her just on a human level and she'll respect you back as well. So just simply that, you know, and I think that when you do that and just stop seeing it as just this cynical exchange of just, you know, money for whatever or sexuality or whatever you want to debase it down to. I think that that's also what we need to get back to versus, you know, the other way of seeing things. And I think that, you know, I know it sounds cliche, but you just have to listen and be present. And even if you need to, you know, there's a little tool I do, like sometimes you can, if you want to be present in the moment, you know what you do, you touch your fingertips together kind of in succession, one, two, three, four, five, or you wiggle your toes, something as stupid as that just being present and feeling your body, then that makes you present. And if your wife's talking to you, then you focus on the words and do some active listening, you know? So that in and of itself, women complain about all the time. So if you need to be present, but you're having a hard time, maybe you're a little ADHD or whatever it is, you're distracted from your busy day, take a deep breath, count to 10, and just get present with your body. And being present with your body will connect you back with your mind. So then you can just take a step back and say, okay, I'm going to listen and be present right now. So... That's really what it is. And then just being empathetic with yourself. Have some self-care. Don't beat yourself up over little things that maybe you didn't do. And just, you know, life is always a journey. I see it as one big adventure from birth to death. But then along that rim of that circle of birth to death, there's all those little small circles that are the opportunities to take those little journeys, you know, where you say, okay, I'm going to use the structure of the hero's journey as a tool. My wife's trying to talk to me. That's a call to adventure. I Be present. So just use that as a mindfulness tool. We use that word mindfulness a lot, but it really is a great tool. Kind of just be present. So I think women would really appreciate that. And that's just, that is like more than half of the battle, I think, most of the time. 
on everybody's tombstone are two dates with a dash in the middle. What are you doing with the dash? Because it's a long dash in between those two dates. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Several things there that I want to comment on. First of all, a transactional relationship is not hero ball. I mean, if you're if she's there to get money out of you and you're there to get sex out of her, well, you know, that's clearly not being her hero. You know, another thing you mentioned was women valuing a man who listens. And a lot of guys misunderstand that thinking, you know, she wants me to obey her and cut off my balls or whatever. No, you can't know a woman's dreams, fears, wants, needs unless you listen to her. Because then you can be a provider, then you can be a protector, then you can perform the magic of helping her feel safe and comfortable in your presence, which is credited to you as heroism by nearly every woman. She doesn't need you to be Iron Man. She doesn't need you to be the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Hell, as much as they like to put fireman calendars up, you know, in their cubicle when they're young and working their first job, she doesn't need you to be a man in uniform. It's nice, but it's not necessary. Yeah. What she wants you to be is someone who can help her relax, feel safe, so she doesn't have to protect herself, look over her own shoulder, have her own back. And in return, she's freed up to give you all these feminine gifts. You're making the world safe for femininity and women will always credit that to you as heroism. I've noticed great conversation. Anthony, when I send guys to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Anthony, A N T H O N Y, they're going to be teleported to live the hero, which is your website. What can they look forward to when they get there? If you go to Live the Hero and you subscribe to my blog, you'll get all the updates on my blog post and you'll get a few freebies there. So there's sort of a manifesto of heroism and what it can do for your life there. There's a calendar of about 30 days of challenges that you can go through that you can every day you can kind of go through a different aspect of heroism. You know, think about who your heroes are for inspiration or think about times when you acted heroically and just prime yourself to kind of be in that ready state to kind of live heroically every day in some way. And there's free materials there that I think would really benefit men just to kind of get started. And then from there, they can kind of check out some of my videos. They can check out my blog posts. I also write for a website called The Good Men Project. There's a link from my front page from Live the Hero to my articles on Good Men Project. There's a great bunch of material there that I've talked about with my column. It's called The Heroic Man. So that's the place they can go, get some free material, get some things to focus on and to start their own mindful hero's journey in their own life. You know, Anthony, I think your message is an incredibly valuable one and more men need to hear it. So uh, gentlemen, go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Anthony and get you some. And Anthony, man, what a pleasure. This has been a conversation that was on point in so many respects. I think it's not only deep the material you've shared today, but I think it's something that gives guys a lot of food for thought and hopefully will make them stand up and cheer and say, you know what? I can do this thing. I can be a hero, not only to the women in my life, not only to my children, but to everybody I meet and feel good about it. And uh, I especially love the idea of really sorting out for yourself what heroism means to you, what you're willing to fight for and what you really think the world needs to be relieved from and not necessarily listening to every negative voice in your head and uh, seeing it all as an adventure. All of it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Scott. It's been a real pleasure. And guys, check it out. We have all the show notes from this show and all the others, pictures of our guests and uh, free downloadable eBooks and reports that you can get all over at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. I've been talking to lots of you guys absolutely for free. What you're doing is you're signing up for 25 minutes with me at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. And we're talking about what's going on in your life, what your sticking points are, and how to get over those hurdles and start getting better with women and being the man you've always wanted to be, uh, being the hero you've always wanted to be. So you can be next. If you haven't talked to me yet, go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com. Click that button in the upper right-hand corner, and let's get on the phone and chit-chat with each other. You'll find me to be exactly who you think I'm going to be. I don't play some fictional character on this podcast or anywhere else. My driver's license and passport say Scott McKay on them. And as always, as well, gentlemen, thank you so much for supporting this show with your ratings and your reviews on iTunes. I look forward to hearing from more of you guys there also. 
And until I talk to you again real soon on the next episode of the Mountaintop Podcast, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.